Good morning, everyone. We'll start by singing together our gathering song, Our World is One World. Michael Stengel. I am a co-chair of our Sunday ser services ministry. Welcome to the online service of the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Danbury. We're so glad that each of you are able to join us this morning and together in community we can ensure that social distancing does not mean social disengagement. Our weekly services are more than just a gathering of our physical bodies. It is the forming of a sacred time that we make together. Whether you're well-versed in the technology of teleconferencing or this is your first venture, we welcome you. For those of you new among us or reconnecting with fonder hearts, we, re we invite you to introduce yourselves and where you are connecting from in the chat box as you are comfortable. Whatever the faith and traditions of your past, whatever your theological stance, whatever your heritage, whoever you are and whomever you love, we welcome you. You can learn more about us on our website and Facebook page. We encourage you to share our Facebook page and reach out to others who may be isolated at this time and might benefit from their spiritual connection with, a love, with our loving community. We have a few uh, announcements uh, this morning. Um, all of the information of all of this uh, can also be found in your order of service. A link was, is in your email uh, that, that you received this morning for the, for the Zoom meeting. Uh, the young adults of UUCD will meet today at 12 p.m. via Zoom. Uh, Sequoia Lowe is the contact for, for that if you are looking for more information. Sam McCoy's Black Voices of the 20th Century uh, will continue to meet tomorrow at 7 p.m. Uh, Sam is the contact for that if you're looking for more information. And there will be a UUCD virtual choir video that Jerry Phelps is putting together. And uh, everyone is invited to, uh, to participate, the more the merrier. And Jerry is the contact for that if you're looking for more information. After our service, we invite you to stay and participate in a breakout group for individual connections and deeper check-ins. Again, welcome to the UU Congregation of Danbury, where we welcome all in a spirit of compassion, inquiry, and service. 
Thank you, Michael, and good morning, everyone. It is so good to be with you this morning. It is the last day of February 2021, and I am practically doing jumping jacks in my uh, living room or whatever because I'm so excited about the fact that we are we are going to make it to March. <laughs> so bless you all for carrying on together through this memorable winter. Today we are focused on what I'm sure was a Sesame Street featured word when I was a kid. Collaboration. I can just see the Muppets coming up with their putting together of the words of syllables. Collaboration. You are going to hear it a gazillion times today. Please try not to count. Sometimes a single word can encapsulate so much. I hope you'll enjoy all the ways we find today to unpack and celebrate just some of what is possible and might be possible through collaboration. In one cohort of UU Congregation's collective mission statement is the sentence, uh, we derive and amplify our strength through collaboration. We derive and amplify our strengths through collaboration. May we here feel the ways that we rely upon and energize each other this morning. May we be inspired and reminded of our deep connections with others today. Come, join us in co-creating this sacred time and space together. Please find a candle or chalice close by if you have one and join me in lighting your chalice. And then in a moment, I'll lead us in our chalice lighting words. Love is the spirit of this congregation and justice is its light. This is our covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek and speak the truth in love, to help one another and celebrate life. Good morning. It is good to be together. If there are children and youth who are in the room but not near the screen yet, now would be a good time to come over for today's time for all ages. There will be a video. While you're on your way over, I'll mention as usual that you are invited during coffee hour when the adults go into their breakout rooms to come over to the religious education Zoom room. I do need one parent today to join me as the second adult for that. Two other things. If you have a mystery buddy, we are starting week three of our mystery buddy postcard exchanges this week. So please don't forget to send out a postcard. And finally, families have received an email this morning with information about getting involved in the Poor People's Campaign with children and youth. Please see the email titled Today in Religious Education for details. Let's say together the children's affirmation. We are Unitarian Universalists. We are people with open minds, loving hearts and helping hands. We care for the earth and each other. Have you ever heard of a paradox? A paradox can be two things being true at the same time even though it doesn't seem like both those things can be true at once. Or something that is true that seems like a contradiction. Here's one paradox. Some things we have more of when we share. We've talked about this before. Remember how sometimes we use one candle to light another candle? And I say, Oh, look, now we have more light. The first light doesn't get smaller when it's shared. We just keep on growing our light with each candle we add. Love is like this. We grow it and spread it by sharing it. 
When a new child arrives into a family, everyone in the family, adults and kids, grow the love in their family by loving the new child. The love that was already there never gets smaller. But sometimes a kid will say, okay, I get it. Love grows when we share it, but that doesn't work for everything. What about energy and time and money? Those don't grow if we share them. And it is true that there is a law of physics that energy can neither be created nor destroyed. It just changes form. So yeah, some things, they aren't exactly like love. But energy and time and money are interesting examples when it comes not to physics, but to human relationships. Have you ever gone to a birthday party where the more excited everyone got, the more excited you got? Where it felt like the energy was contagious and the more the kids at the party ran around or got silly, the more you ran around or got silly? Or have you spent energy helping a friend with something that you knew how to do that they didn't? And then it gave you a little burst of energy to try something you'd been wanting to do or try. And sometimes things like money and time can do more if we start out with one bigger amount of them and share than if we try to each do our own thing with our time and money in our own little corner. If all the kids in your neighborhood want to play basketball together and everybody pitches in what they can, without anybody needing to have a whole lot of money. You might be able to get a nice basketball court in the park. Then everyone can play and no one family has to spend a bunch of money getting a hoop set up at their house. Let's go back to that example of a new child coming into a family. Say a baby arrives in your family now you could say, oh no, now I have to share all my toys. On the other hand, the new baby is going to be sharing all their toys with you too. And you might not like playing with some of those toys. Maybe baby toys are not your thing. But honestly, your baby probably won't be interested in all your toys either. But you'll both have more by sharing. And you'll have more fun by playing together. So even though our paradox seems to make the most sense for things that aren't finite, things we can't count or that don't have a set amount like love, there are ways that it is also true for things that are finite, that are limited like toys. We have more when we share them. Well, the video I thought on my end was a little glitchy, but thank you for your patience in watching a video that I tried with some, some technology I hadn't used before. Let's move now into a time of sharing our love by holding in connected community those personal milestones that are lifting our spirits or weighing them down those personal joys and sorrows that community can hold with us now. You may share joys and sorrows in the chat and you may also wish to recognize this sharing ritually by dropping a stone in a bowl or lighting a candle. Let us now connect with one another in the chat.
we honor all of these and the unspoken joys and sorrows that remain in our hearts. This morning's reflection from Reverend Heather will be on congregational collaborations, as she said. And the good news is that we already have some current and active partnerships happening with our neighboring congregations. Reverend Heather asked if I could take a moment to share with you about some of these partnerships, which I consider just the smallest hint of possibilities that we could continue to expand long into the future. So I'll point to three, all help happening in the realm of religious education and family ministry. High school youth are accustomed to regular collaborations with other congregations because youth ministry has a long history of having both local and regional dimensions. Not just national, but regional youth conferences or cons as they are affectionately called, were a shared congregational tradition even when my father was active as a teen in liberal religious youth, LRY, the Unitarian Universalist Youth Organization that came before Young Religious Unitarian Universalist, or YRUU, which was the organization in which I was active as a teen. I have many fond memories of my relationships with congregations in what was then the Mountain Desert District of the Unitarian Universalist Association. By regularly gathering, gathering for a weekend of shared programming in one another's physical meeting spaces, myself and many of the other teens in my region developed a sense that Unitarian Universalism was not a local phenomenon or a quirk of our families, but a broad religious community that was well beyond our own particulars. So it is no surprise that youth groups were among the first to reach out in the pandemic for shared programming. I am regularly sending invitations to the youth in our congregation to participate in offerings of youth groups throughout Connecticut. Most recently, the group in Manchester invited Connecticut youth to join them for a workshop to learn about Afrocobra, an African-American art collective of the 60s and 70s. But an example, not just of invitational participation, but of the tentative beginnings of a foundation for what could later perhaps become some shared program building would be two parent groups that have formed during the pandemic jointly with the Mattatech Unitarian Universalist Society in Woodbury. One began as a program in this congregation, but was expanded to include the Mattatech congregation to benefit both congregations by giving us a right sized group. That would be the Parents of Preschoolers program, which is a curriculum shared with us from First Parish Kingston in Massachusetts. The second group has formed jointly from the beginning with motivations ranging from a right-sized group to making sure that parents of children of all ages would have other parents to talk to with same age children. This is our parent covenant group, which met for the second time this last week. Participants in both congregations have shared their sense of an enhanced experience by having the involvement of parents from both congregations. Though our congregation has sponsored this group to date, I have experienced such efforts expanding in other congregations to increasingly shared programs. Just as one example, when I was working in a congregation in Worcester, Massachusetts, the other Unitarian Universalist congregation in town, along with two more neighboring congregations from nearby towns started a shared summer camp to keep children who weren't otherwise attending in the summer engaged in their relationship with the congregation and engaged in supported ways in their continued religious development. There is no way any of these congregations, though they all had paid directors of religious education, could have pulled off the massive and inspiring programs they did had they not been working together. There are so many ways I have seen shared resources benefit congregations I've worked with over the years, and I'm encouraged by the openness of this congregation to the particular experiments we have been doing with shared programming through the pandemic. 
having spoken so much this morning of sharing resources, I will pass things off to Michael Stengel for today's offering, the invitation to share our personal resources in the congregational community. Though, if you wish to share more in the chat about your own experiences with congregational collaborations, please do so. And I'll pass things off to Michael. Thank you, Sierra Marie. We come to the time for our congregational offering. If you're with us for the first time, feel free to pass the virtual plate. Your presence here in the Zoom room is your gift to us. Members, please click the link on your screen in the, in the chat to make a donation or pledge. For even though we are not in our beloved fellowship hall, our operating expenses are still the same. You may also mail a check to UUCD at 24 Clapperd Ridge Road in Danbury. Thank you for doing your part to support and sustain this community we love. Now, please join me in our congregational response. In the spirit of compassion and service, we dedicate these, our offerings. <laughs> Thank you so much for that, Jerry, and for having that be the song that we were bopping around the house singing this weekend. All right, so here's one example of a congregational collaboration from my own distant past. In 2008, I took on a kind of ridiculous adventure to be a very part-time consulting minister for a congregation in Twin Falls, Idaho. I lived and served the UU Fellowship of Central Oregon in Bend at the time in some part-time capacity that we inched up incrementally a little bit each year. So I was available for other work and glad for the income. And anyway, I've always liked a bit of traveling someplace new. Have any of you ever been to Twin Falls? I'm looking. Any, uh, no, no, I'm not seeing any hands yet. Twin Falls, Idaho was and is, like most places, a very specific place with its own fascinating convergence of influences, largely Mormon, very geological, 
flat, coincidentally also along I-84, but in that interstate highways case across and through Southern Idaho. After some research into flying and what all that could involve, I ended up driving first in my old red Volvo station wagon and for subsequent weekends in a rental car that, so that I'd have cruise control and a working CD player. It was 2008. From Bend to Twin Falls can be done somewhere in the ballpark of seven to eight hours of nonstop driving. But I would stop once, usually, at the Oasis Cafe in Gentura, Oregon, for a reliably well-made BLT. There's really not a lot else going on, um, but that's a story and reflection for another time. I'm sharing this seemingly random story with you because it was Unitarian Universalism and my own Taurusness that brought me into this somewhat absurd solo road trip experience when once a month for a year, I would drive on Friday or Saturday from Bend to Twin Falls, lead the service on Sunday morning, have a few meetings or pastoral care visits that afternoon, and then get in my car and drive back the almost eight hours to bend. It's like completely bonkers now when I think about it. I listened to some great audiobooks on those long drives. And I also remember the people of that congregation and the stories that I got to hear of those fine and dedicated UU folks. Several of them were previously Mormon and coming to Unitarian Universalism from Mormonism could be its own special Skinner House book of unique stories. Several of the board leaders were parents with young children at home. I still remember clearly getting to hear about and witness the transformative power of the karate training in one family's life in terms of their children gaining self-control, self-restraint, and a community of discipline. I look back now and marvel at the hours I spent in the car to get to and from this smaller congregation for six hours or so on a Sunday in Southern Idaho. But I also marvel at how warmly I was welcomed into their lives and in the workings of their very particular congregation based entirely on our shared commitment to this long syllable faith, Unitarian Universalism. We are a denomination relatively small in our human number, even when all totaled up. As congregations, we already depend upon each other for so much wisdom, commonality, and mutual support. And as individuals in this country, we often seek out UU congregations in our trips or moves because there is a relationship between our congregations, right? A somewhat unquantifiable value in reference to Sierra Marie's paradox reflection earlier. No matter our distance from one another, there is something that binds us together or causes us to feel a relationship with one another. Upon this common thread, this relationship, we can rely. I felt the same deeply held values for mutual respect, the independent search for truth and meaning, and our human interconnectedness when I traveled in 2019 to the Philippines to visit with Universalists there, and to Northern India to visit the Unitarian Universalists there. Today, I arranged for us to sing or hear some old hymns from our gray hymnal, even my inner jury is out on whether the whether or not these are oldies but goodies. Among another among our older hymns is "We Are Not Our Own." It is a natural human paradox. I bet it's pretty primal and deeply ingrained in our physical bodies to focus in on what seem to be our own concerns. But we are not our own. In times of stress and pandemic, we actually lean on each other more. In the greater Hartford area, parish minister colleagues were observing the fatigue of staff and volunteers who'd been figuring out and running the tech for all our online activities this past year and brainstormed together a five Sunday series we called the Connecticut UU Tour. This enabled each participating congregation to give its staff and tech teams some Sundays off in January 
and for our congregants to experience Sunday services led by each of the five participating congregations, Hartford, Manchester, West Hartford, New London, and New Haven in Hamden. We here in Danbury had already planned out our month by the time that Connecticut UU tour was coming together. But as Sierra Marie described, our youth groups did connect a bit with one another along the way, and such collaborations could certainly happen again, albeit continuing to morph to evolve some hopefully more in-person components in the future. And I will say that all those, many of those services you could go find, that's the other amazing thing about this pandemic, right? Services that normally would have been live and in person and then over are now available as recordings all over the place. So, so if you're interested in seeing a service in uh, New Haven or New London or um, Manchester, it's much easier. Many of them already had recordings up, but it's easier for, for us now who have all figured out this technology and, um, and congregations are more likely to have their service recordings up. So it's something you can do in addition to your Sunday morning time here. Who is around those of us and those of you who feel based in Danbury and the Danbury area anyway? Who might we talk with, think with, or simply dream about connecting with in some more substantial ways as we continue to find our way into this 21st century? Well, within 25 miles of 24 Clapboard Ridge Road in Danbury are the following other UU congregations. Mattituck UU Society in Woodbury, as Sierra Marie mentioned, reports 63 members at last count. The Unitarian Church in Westport reports 363 members. The UU Fellowship of Northern Westchester in Mount Kisco, New York has 100 members. UU Church of Greater Bridgeport in Stratford has 33 members. Fourth UU Congregation of Westchester County in Mohegan Lake, New York has 46 members. And the UU Congregation in Stamford, Connecticut reports 62 members. So except for Westport at 363, we are all around the same size roughly. Um, and, and there's a lot we could do together to support one another and also to learn from and build on and work with each other and what we're all trying to do. This is kind of an aside, but I left it in here because some of you might find it interesting and, and energizing. Most of these seven congregations that I've just listed are LGBTQ welcoming congregations, but not all of them. Some are honor congregations in support of our UUA, but not all. Only one, Westport, is an accredited green sanctuary, a program which you can find out a lot more about online. None are AIM certified congregations, which is a UU program about becoming a more accessible and inclusive congregation for all people, including those with disabilities. Hartford is, so if you're interested in learning about that certification process, which got going back in 2016, you can, um, I could put anybody who's interested in touch with the folks in the Hartford congregation who are part of that process. There are so many endeavors we could work on together. So those certification programs are just uh, one small handful. And many, many UU congregations are already collaborating with one another. Some like UUCD in ways that we don't acknowledge or celebrate nearly enough. I expect for all of, for most all of you, except maybe the folks on the REMT, the RE ministry team, the collaborations that Sierra Marie listed out might have been things you weren't aware of that have been going on for the past almost year now. Multi-UU congregational collaboration can take many forms. And this is rare that I do this kind of like listing out of facts um, service, but, uh, but if you are inclined to take notes on any of this stuff, I wouldn't um, deter you because there's just a lot of detail in here. So if any of these things are interesting to you, jot them down to, to look up more. There are five UU congregations in central Illinois that are engaged in an 11 week session working through the widening of the circle commission on institutional change report with 65 people enrolled in that 11 week weekly discussion online. So that's impressive to me. 
Three UU congregations in Down East Maine collaboratively host an intern minister. Similarly, a Southern Oregon UU partnership of three congregations, two of which are lay led only, share an intern minister along with other programs. My own internship back in 2004 or five was a yoked internship serving two congregations, one where I was supervised by the minister there and one where I was as intern minister, the only minister they had, which was a remarkable and at times stressful, but remarkable learning experience for me. So I love that model. In the Western New York, Pennsylvania area, a little closer to us, there are multiple UU congregations that have led joint worship services and also held a spirituality retreat together. In the Denver, Colorado area, UU congregations have collaborated on a number of projects, most recently initiating and supporting an online UU community for Black, Indigenous, and people of color UUs that is open to participants worldwide called The Mountaintop. I, I had just, I just learned about that in researching uh, for this service this past week. So promptly sent off that URL to some BIPOC UUs I know who weren't aware of it. So that's a really exciting online UU community that is growing rapidly right now. A five-year collaboration between five UU congregations in the Milwaukee, Wisconsin area has created a Black Lives Matter to Wisconsin UUs organization. It's its own nonprofit, which came together to facilitate racial justice education within our congregations and to coordinate and amplify the voice of Unitarian Universalists in racial justice work and actions within the greater Milwaukee metro area. There are just a couple more. The Potomac Partnership includes the UU congregations of Fairfax, Virginia, River Road in Bethesda, Maryland, and Cedar Lane, also in Bethesda. And they are engaged in shared Sunday services, musical events and classes, sharing music resources for services, sharing and pastoral care training of lay leaders and support and stewardship discussions, adult education programming, anti-racism curriculum, art classes, sexuality educator, educator training, and middle and high school fellowship events. And they have their own website where you can go, Potomac Partnership UU, you can go and um, scroll through all the, if you are a member of any one of those three congregations, all their events that are open to any member of all those three congregations, any member of one of those three congregations can attend like a whole series. They have a special calendar, in other words, for their shared open to the three congregation events, um, which is, um, impressive. They are all quite a bit larger congregations. And so that partnership partly made sense because their senior ministers had a friendship and, um, and uh, similar structures that they were working with. Um, but it, they're all still inspiring all these different models in different ways. Closer to those of us here in Connecticut, the Long Island Area Council of UU Congregations brings together all 11 UU congregations on Long Island for education, advocacy, service, and spirituality. They also have a website and a mission statement. I'm multitasking here. There's the Long Island Area UU Council of Congregations website and a mission in the chat and a mission statement which reads, we serve as a catalyst to promote denominational awareness and effectiveness through communication, leadership and educational programs. And lastly, which does not mean this is, there are many, many, many examples out there. There's also a whole other thing called covenanting communities which are non, um, brick and mortar congregations uh, that I'm not getting into today, but um, this could go on for a long time and I want to uh, prevent that. So lastly for today, the Baja Four, as my ministerial colleagues refer to them in Southern Arizona, are four UU congregations that have been doing worship together online since March, 2020, as well as some collaborative religious education and justice work before and during pandemic. In October, 2020, the boards of all four of these UU congregations, whose membership numbers range from 76 to 289 people, 
the boards, I just love that for some reason, that, that takes more coordination, right, of groups of people. The boards met together and crafted a common purpose statement, which just gives me goosebumps for some reason. Their purpose statement is, we transform lives and our region, living our values at large as Unitarian Universalists in Southern Arizona. We derive and amplify our strength through collaboration. Southern Arizona is its own, like Twin Falls, its own fascinating, specific, unique place, right? So it's close to the border um, and there's, there's a lot of unique challenges they deal with there. And so that they have figured out ways to work together and address those challenges and be Unitarian Universalists together is so inspiring to me. Taking in all the possibilities can be totally overwhelming. There are as many different ways of collaborating as there are of being religious communities, perhaps more. Way, way, way back now, way, way, way back now in 2015 or so, some significant UUA energy was put into distilling certain approaches to multi-congregational collaboration and gathering examples of these ideas in action. You can see what I'm about to talk about here at this website, which it's hilarious to me that it's already out of date because it's only 2015 or so. But um, uh, in brief, this multi-site effort that I've just put in the chat identified four types of multi-congregational collaborations. The first is branch and campus, sometimes called satellite models that emerge as a congregation grows another site or campus and reaches out to an existing congregation to offer support uh, or branch or reaches out to an existing congregation to offer support. A hub church, usually the larger membership church in the area, anchors the network offering support to sister communities or creating a new sister site that extends their reach. Examples of this form are mostly on the West Coast, though there are some in New York State as well. And that's partly because of Unitarian Universalist history, right? And the way that our congregations are younger for the most part on the West Coast. Yoked congregations, this is the second type of partnering. Um, yoked congregations like my internship are congregations that join forces to create a larger staff team or to achieve a full-time ministry, but retain their own budget, bylaws, and boards. The third type is partnering congregations that create a distinct covenanting community with an expanded mission. Several of the examples I gave previously would go into this category where congregations retain their individual identity, but form a separate entity with other congregations to take on regional endeavors. And the fourth kind is merging models, which sometimes seek to create one church in multiple locations. They would then share everything from staff to mission and are thus able to achieve a higher profile in the community they serve. Merging is something that some of you who may have paid some attention to the, this congregation's history will recall that UUCD did back in the mid 1960s, when according to the very poetic history of this congregation, written by Reverdy Whitlock in 1998, the Unitarian Fellowship of Ridgefield combined forces with the more well-resourced First Universalist Unitarian Church of Danbury, and together discovered on Pickett's Ridge Road in the westerly reaches of the town of Reading, an early farmhouse with adjacent barn and outbuildings in a bucolic setting on more than two acres of rolling farmland. The purchase price of the Pickett's Ridge buildings was $77,500 with a cash payment at the time of sale of $27,500. And there's other, like you could go way down into the wonderful details uh, and both be amused and informed by uh, reading just the history of this congregation prior to, the history just goes up to 1995. So it's prior to the move to Clapboard Ridge Road. Even if it weren't for the pandemic, what church and community looks like has already been dramatically changing. There were already big, fairly slow moving currents of change underway all across this country and continent. 
even more so that is the case when we zoom in and look at New England specifically and Unitarian Universalist history in New England, where we have Unitarian congregations that were originally Unitarian or Universalist dating back hundreds of years in some cases. And so many towns have the history of both congregations already. There was change already going on for this very particular and beloved congregation as you have gotten accustomed to having a halftime minister since 2018 letting go at least for now of a lot of the stereotypes of what a parish minister is usually thought to be local always available running into you at the grocery store and the coffee shop i miss those days myself friends you have gotten accustomed to sharing your minister with another congregation and have lived into what that feels like. Sometimes I've been able to bring some helpful wisdom or comparisons from my work in Hartford and many of my financial benefits like my health insurance and 90% of my professional expenses have been covered by the Hartford congregation. You have also already experienced sharing a director of religious education with another congregation during the time when Darlene Anderson Alexander was working for both this congregation and the UU congregation in Stamford, where she continues to work along with now working in Mount Kisco. So she is still an example of being a full-time DRE serving two congregations each half time. There are a slew of other ways that congregational collaboration was already occurring, some of which Sierra Murray highlighted earlier. When the COVID pandemic arrived in a matter of hours and just a few days, we moved so many aspects of our lives online and abruptly stopped doing a whole bunch of activities we were accustomed to. We were all powerfully and viscerally reminded once again of our national epidemic of racism. We were forced to look around and take inventory of what is precious to us and what we had been taking for granted. I am deeply grateful that we have all worked together in so many aspects of this congregation, our individual lives and our many surrounding community connections to stay connected with each other. Some of you, I even feel like I've gotten to know a little better during this turbulent time. So, and we will continue to reflect on a year of pandemic uh, in the month of March, that at the March 28th service at the end of the month, that will be our focus, reflecting on a year of pandemic. But I feel like that one of our challenges, right, is distilling what have we learned in pandemic and what have we gone through in pandemic and what was already going on, big picture changes that were already underway in our society, in ourselves, in our congregations, and how do we honor both those processes and, and transformational experiences. So to conclude for now, let the wondrous inspiring percolations of our larger UU community settle in to your heart and mind and ponder whether or not you might feel moved to make something new or more substantial happen between our UU congregations in Southwestern Connecticut and Southeastern New York. I have only just begun mulling on what a useful acronym might be. SOCO Sony is as far as I've gotten. Surely there must be something better than that. What I do know is this, love is the answer, at least for most of the questions in my heart. Why are we here and where do we go and how come it's so hard? We are better together, in Jack Johnson's words. We are better together and there is so much we can do when we work together and dream together and organize and inspire each other and call each other into whatever the future holds and demands of us. We each have a part in community now in the making in every far continent, region, and land as we will sing in our closing hymn. May you find a way to deepen your part, to nourish your spirit by connecting with you use near and far, by helping to imagine and make real the activities that bring us together as neighbors, faith siblings, and fellow travelers. May it be so. Let us move now into the spirit of meditation and prayer. 
As we dream forward, I also appreciated looking back reflecting on the treasures in our Singing the Living Tradition hymnal, as dated as they can also sometimes feel. It's only from the late 80s or early 90s. This reading, number 434, in the back of our gray hymnal, resonated with me in the context of today's service focus. These words are attributed only to Anonymous. May we be reminded here of our highest aspirations and inspired to bring our gifts of love and service to the altar of humanity. May we know once again that we are not isolated beings, but connected in mystery and miracle to the universe, to this community and to each other. May we know once again that we are not isolated beings, but connected in mystery and miracle to the universe, to this community, and to each other. Join me in soaking in a deep breath of silence, of gratitude, of love for each other, of determination to look for the goodness in all things. And then let us sing together along with Jerry, Spirit of Life. We will now extinguish our chalices as we say together our words of affirmation. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts and out into the world until we are together again. Now let us join our voices together uh, with our closing hymn, We Sing Now Together. Ages have brought for life that in 
life that unfolds us and helps and heals and holds us and leads beyond the goals which our forebears once sought. May this community always be one that is dreaming forward, imagining new possibilities and new ways of doing things. With gratitude for all that holds us together, may we feel within us and within this congregation, the strength to widen the circle of blessing and also the energy to move ourselves out into the larger world beyond these Zoom boxes. Following the postlude, stay with us for breakout groups if you'd like, and if you're heading off into the rest of whatever your Sunday holds during the postlude is a good time to do that. During the breakout groups today, if you brainstorm any great ideas for congregational collaboration, please let me, Sierra Marie, or any of our board members know. No matter what challenges may feel overwhelming to you, may you keep holding on, resolutely in peace, sharing your love, and creating justice. <laughs> <laughs>